I'm going to explain what happened in the 10 deadliest airshow disasters in history, starting with the shocking story of a disaster that was caused by a pilot that never should have been flying the plane. And be sure to stick around to the end to hear the terrifying truth about one of the deadliest airshow disasters that you probably never heard of before. My name is Hoover and welcome to your pilot debrief. And in no particular order, the first deadliest airshow disaster took place in 1972 in Sacramento, California, at the very end of the Golden West Sport Aviation Airshow. Richard Bingham was a pilot flying an F-86 Sabre in this disaster, but shockingly, despite having over 2,500 hours of flight time, Richard had almost zero experience flying the F-86. He was extremely overconfident, as the investigation revealed that he told his instructor that he felt he had mastered the aircraft after just two hours behind the controls. The ironic thing about the air show was that Richard wasn't even scheduled to perform. He had flown in merely to showcase the aircraft as a static display, and no one expected tragedy to strike as he prepared to depart, performing what should have been a routine takeoff. As he taxied out for takeoff, he requested to use a longer runway, but was told there would be a delay, so he settled for taking off on runway 30. This runway was a thousand feet shorter, and it was pointed directly at an ice cream parlor. This last minute decision to use the shorter runway set the stage for the disaster. As Richard began his takeoff roll, the F-86 struggled, briefly lifting off twice before settling back down onto the runway. Richard said that he felt a vibration as he tried to get airborne, but rather than rejecting the takeoff, he chose to press on. The investigation would later reveal that there was nothing wrong with the aircraft. He just tried to rotate too early and the lack of sufficient airflow over the wing is what caused the vibration. Richard simply didn't know what he was doing. Unable to gain altitude, he overran the runway, struck a berm, and ripped through a chain link fence. The aircraft's two external fuel tanks ruptured and ignited, creating a massive fireball. The jet, now an uncontrollable inferno, barreled across the street at nearly 150 miles per hour. It collided with a car, instantly claiming the lives of its two occupants before crashing into Farrell's ice cream parlor, finally coming to a catastrophic halt. The aftermath was devastating. 22 lives were lost, including 12 children. Ironically, Richard survived the crash, but he never should have been flying that plane. The next deadliest airshow disaster on our list took place in 1973, where the skies above the Paris airshow became the stage for a dramatic showdown between the Soviet Union and France. At the heart of this tragedy was a fierce rivalry in the race for the development of supersonic transport aircraft, pitting the British-French Concorde against the Soviet Tupolev Tu-144. The Tu-144 was an immense source of pride for the USSR, as it had achieved its first supersonic flight four months prior to the Concorde. During the air show, the Tu-144 was flown by a highly skilled pilot named Mikhail Kozlov and his crew. Prior to the crash, the pilot was overheard declaring, just wait until you see us fly, then you'll see something. On the day of the show, the Concorde had already performed, executing a high-speed flyby followed by a dramatic climb. However, the performance was deemed lackluster by some spectators, fueling rumors that the Soviet pilot was determined to outshine his Western counterpart. As the Tu-144 took to the skies, it attempted a similar maneuver. Renowned pilot Bob Hoover, a legend in the aviation world, was there on hand to witness the event. And he said that when the Tu-144 pilot performed that same maneuver, he pulled the nose up so steeply, I didn't believe he could possibly recover. Tragically, the Soviet aircraft stalled at just below 2,000 feet and pitched over into a steep dive. The investigation into the crash spawned a theory that a French Mirage aircraft allegedly conducting espionage and attempting to photograph the Tu-144 forced the Soviet pilot into the dangerous maneuver. Although France initially denied the Mirage's presence, it was later confirmed, raising the possibility that even though there might not have been a risk of a collision, the Soviet pilot might have been surprised and just overreacted. In a desperate attempt to recover from the steep dive, the pilot pulled back on the controls, but it was too late. The aircraft disintegrated midair, likely due to the immense stress on the airframe. As the wreckage plummeted into the ground, it destroyed 15 houses, claiming the lives of all six crew members on board and eight people on the ground, while severely injuring 60 others. For the next airshow disaster on our list, we're going to head up to England for the story of a pilot that was actually tried for manslaughter after crashing his Hawker Hunter jet on a local highway during the 2015 Shoreham Airshow. This disaster involved Andy Hill, 
a pilot with an impressive background of over 12,000 flight hours, including time spent as a former Royal Air Force instructor and a captain at British Airways. Andy was supposed to perform a bent loop during the show. This is a complex maneuver where the aircraft climbs into a loop with a quarter turn before spiraling back down. The maneuver began with a low pass along the runway, followed by a turn for a second pass. However, the execution deviated fatally from the norm. In order to successfully complete the maneuver, you need to have sufficient altitude and airspeed at the start. But the investigation revealed that Andy began the maneuver at a dangerously low altitude of 185 feet, far below the recommended 500 feet. Andy also needed a speed of at least 350 knots with full power when he started his climb, but he was only traveling at 310 knots with less than full power. As the aircraft climbed through the air, Andy is supposed to make an assessment at the top of the loop to ensure that he had enough altitude and airspeed to complete the back half of the loop, otherwise he needed to terminate the maneuver. The target that he was looking for was 4,000 feet at 150 knots, but instead Andy's jet reached the top at a mere 3,000 feet and 105 knots. This meant that it was going to be physically impossible for him to complete the loop, but that didn't stop him from trying. The result was a disaster. Andy desperately pulled back on the controls as hard as he could to avoid the ground, but it was too late. His Hawker Hunter jet crashed in a nose-high attitude onto a busy highway, erupting into a massive fireball that engulfed several cars. 11 people lost their lives and 16 others were injured in this devastating incident. In the aftermath, Andy Hill faced manslaughter charges but was ultimately found not guilty and the Shoreham Air Show hasn't been held since. Unfortunately, this wasn't the deadliest air show disaster in the United Kingdom, as we're going to see another one later on in our list. Before we look at the details of that next disaster in the UK, we're going to take a look at a tragedy that took place in Belgium on July 26, 1997 at the Ostend Air Show. The skies above the show became the backdrop for a devastating accident involving Captain Omar Bilal of the Jordanian Air Force's Royal Falcons demonstration team. He was performing a solo display in a Walter Extra EA-300. This is a two-seat aerobatic monoplane crafted by the renowned German pilot and manufacturer Walter Extra. Perhaps the most interesting thing about this disaster is that the details about the crash are shrouded in a mystery. What is known, pieced together from sparse online news reports and unverified sources, paints a picture of a competition steeped in ambition and risk. Allegedly, there were four pilots, including Captain Bilal, who were competing in the air show for the coveted Mission Impossible trophy. Captain Bilal was the last one to perform, and the news reports indicated that the surface winds were quite gusty during his performance. We do know that the pilot was performing some spins at a very low altitude and almost directly above the crowd. The most popular theory is that he lost spatial awareness during those spins and continued his maneuvers as the gusty winds pushed his aircraft over the crowd. During the performance, the aircraft entered a steep dive and the reason why is still unclear. Witnesses have varied accounts. Some say he was attempting a loop, others speculated he had an engine failure, while still others believed he simply misjudged his airspeed and pointed the nose down to recover. Regardless of the reason for the dive, the truth is that he was still too low to the ground, and he was still over the crowd. Unable to recover, the aircraft plummeted into the crowd, and in a tragic sense of irony, he crashed right next to a Red Cross first aid tent. The aircraft burst into flames, claiming the lives of the pilot and nine spectators, and seriously injuring 60 others as the flames and debris rained down upon them. The Austin Air Show was never held again, and the next deadly air show disaster that we're going to look at might be one that you've already heard of because it's the second deadliest air show disaster in the world, which is why I'm going to try and share a few things that you might not know about the Ramstein Air Show crash in 1988. On that fateful day, three pilots from the Italian Air Force display team collided while performing a pierced heart maneuver during their performance, crashing to the ground in front of and into a crowd of almost 300,000 spectators. The lead pilot responsible for the crash was Lieutenant Colonel Ivo Nutarelli, callsign Pony 10. He was the oldest on the team and had over 4,000 hours of flight time, and he had already performed the pierced heart maneuver 70 times during his career, but one mistake was all it took to cause this tragedy. On the day of the disaster, as they began the maneuver, five jets split off to the right to make one side of the heart, and four jets turned left to make the other side. 
the two formations are supposed to thread through each other in front of the crowd at just 130 feet above the ground, with the solo performer, Nutarelli, piercing the heart. The only problem is that during this attempt, Nutarelli completed his loop too high, so in order to correct, he increased his dive angle, and unfortunately this led to him going too fast. He tried to use his air brake to slow down, and he pulled back as hard as he could, increasing the load on the aircraft to 10 times the force of gravity, exceeding the aircraft limit of 7 Gs, but it wasn't enough. His aircraft clipped Pony 2, smashing the cockpit and killing the pilot instantly. Pony 2's aircraft disintegrated in midair and sprayed burning metal parts across the airstrip below. Nutarelli's jet then crashed into Pony 1, shattering its tail section. This is the impact that killed Nutarelli and sent his plane cartwheeling in flames across the sky. Pony 1, however, managed to eject, but he was unfortunately too close to the ground for his parachute to open, and he's killed when his body strikes the runway. The crowd, in absolute shock, watched as Nutarelli's jet hurtled towards them, crashing just 50 meters from the front row, igniting 300 gallons of jet fuel. The burning aircraft skidded into the crowd, colliding with an ice cream truck, and in total, 70 people perished and 346 people sustained serious injuries. The next deadly airshow disaster took place at the Farnborough Air Show in 1952 in what was the deadliest airshow in the United Kingdom's history. John Derry, one of Britain's most esteemed test pilots at the time, accompanied by flight test observer Anthony Richards, were at the helm of the prototype de Havilland DH-110 fighter jet, a symbol of an era when fighter jets were just beginning to pierce the sound barrier. John's performance at the show was a testament to this new age of speed. He soared the aircraft to an astonishing 40,000 feet, then plunged into a dive, accelerating and breaking the sound barrier as he made his way towards show center. He slowed down as he approached the crowd, and as the jet roared overhead at about a thousand feet, the delayed supersonic booms from miles away finally converged with the aircraft, sending a shockwave through the crowd. After disappearing from view, John prepared for another high-speed pass, this time clocking around 600 miles per hour. But as he attempted a right-hand climbing turn away from the audience, a catastrophic design flaw revealed itself. Tragically, the aircraft swept wings, placed the ailerons well aft of the aircraft's center of gravity, and this turn caused the wings' outer panels to twist. In less than a second, the aircraft disintegrated. The cockpit, with two crew members still inside, crashed to the ground right in front of the spectators closest to the runway, injuring several people. The engine separated from the aircraft and flew through the air before one crashed harmlessly, while the other engine plowed into a crowd of spectators, causing most of the fatalities. This disaster claimed 31 lives and left 60 others injured, and was a rare instance where pilot error wasn't to blame, a stark contrast to the next deadly airshow disaster on our list that took place in Toronto in 1995, involving a pilot whose attempt to conceal a mistake led to a fatal outcome, tragically costing several lives. Flight Lieutenant Dom Gilbert, a seasoned Royal Air Force pilot, led his crew of seven aboard a Nimrod aircraft to participate in the Canadian International Air Show. They were supposed to conduct a four and a half minute routine that was described as relatively straightforward, doing mostly the same maneuvers that had been performed for almost 20 years to showcase the Nimrod. Unfortunately, there were two things about this performance that would make it different. First of all, Gilbert had made a critical error while performing a dumbbell turn at a previous air show, inadvertently flying over the crowd. Now the shocking part isn't that he made a mistake, it's that the mistake wasn't reported as it should have been, and there was no pilot debrief for him to learn from the mistake and get some training to avoid repeating it in the future. Instead, Gilbert took it upon himself to decide that during the next show, he would just reduce the engine power to slow down, and then he would tighten his turn to avoid overflying the crowd. And any pilot will tell you that going slow and trying to pull harder to turn faster is the perfect recipe for a stall. But before we get to that, the second thing that made this performance different was Gilbert's attitude. Because he gave an interview the day prior to the crash, where he said that his plan was to approach the limits of the aircraft's performance. And unfortunately, this set the stage for the disaster. The day of the performance arrived and Gilbert's routine included two dumbbell turns. During this maneuver, the aircraft performs a turn away from the display line and climbs to approximately 1,000 feet, and then performs a turn in the opposite direction, descending back onto the display line. 
Now the first turn went as planned and it was followed by a slow flyby. But as Gilbert initiated the second turn, the aircraft's nose pitched up to 24 degrees, and because he kept the engine power pulled back, the airspeed rapidly decreased to 122 knots at the top of his climb. That was far below the recommended 150 knots. As the aircraft began its descent, the combination of low speed and increasing G-force to 1.6 Gs proved to be too much, and the aircraft stalled. Its nose dropped sharply, and the bank angle increased to 85 degrees. Despite a desperate attempt to use full power to recover, they were just too low. The aircraft crashed into the water, claiming the lives of all seven crew members instantly, and the investigation determined that Lieutenant Gilbert was the sole cause of the accident. The next deadliest airshow disaster on our list took place in 2011, back in the United States at the Reno Air Races. This tragedy was unique because it wasn't caused by pilot error, but rather a series of unforeseen mechanical failures. At the heart of the disaster was the Galloping Ghost, a P-51 Mustang that had been transformed through extensive modifications to be lighter and faster. But unfortunately, these changes compromised its stability. The pilot, 74-year-old Jimmy Leeward, was highly experienced, having competed in air races since the 1980s. Jimmy was in excellent health, and he had prepared extensively for this race, and one of the aircraft modifications that he made involved the P-51 elevator control system. This is a critical component that controls the aircraft's pitch, and the accident investigation uncovered a photo snapped by a spectator just moments before the crash, showing the left elevator trim tab missing. You see, over the years, as the trim tab moved up and down in flight, it had gradually worn out its lock nuts, which hadn't been replaced since 1985. This meant that the screws had room to wiggle back and forth in flight, causing cracks that had been growing undetected for years. During the qualifying round, Jimmy could tell that there was something wrong with the elevator trim tabs. The maintenance crew took a look at it and discovered and fixed the loose screws on the right trim tab, but they never bothered to check the left one. During the next race, everything appeared normal until during one of the laps when Jimmy's P-51 encountered turbulence from another aircraft in front of him. As he tried to correct his course, disaster struck. That neglected left trim tab failed. Its linkage snapping under stress allowed the trim tab to rotate far beyond its normal nose-up position. This sent the P-51 into an uncontrollable climb at a staggering 17.3 times the force of gravity well beyond human tolerance levels, rendering Jimmy immediately unconscious. Near the top of the climb, the elevator trim tab finally broke off, and the P-51 began a steep dive, crashing into the box seating area in front of the grandstands, immediately killing Jimmy and 10 spectators, while injuring at least 69 others. The next deadliest airshow disaster took place in 2002 in the Ukraine, and despite the high number of casualties, this is not the last disaster on our list. However, this disaster was quite controversial because some say it was all a cover-up to protect those in power while blaming the pilots for what happened, but I want to know what you think after you hear the story. On a Saturday in July, a Ukrainian Su-27 was scheduled to perform for the air show. The fighter jet was being flown by Vladimir Topinar and another pilot named Yuri Igorov. Supposedly, a request was made for the pilots to have more training to prepare for the show because the pilots felt like the maneuvers they were being asked to perform were too advanced for them, but this request was denied because the government said it would be too expensive. However, some of those that attended the show reported that they had actually seen these same two pilots perform the exact same maneuvers at other air shows, so it's not clear what the truth is regarding their experience level. One thing that we know for certain is that the pilots made radio calls expressing confusion over where the crowd line was. Supposedly, they had been given a map, but the map didn't match the actual air show layout. As the pilots conducted their performance, they attempted to perform a split S maneuver. This is where they roll the aircraft upside down and then dive towards the ground, completing the bottom half of a loop. As they neared the bottom, they continued making a turn, but they clipped a tree before striking the tarmac and dragging four rows of barbed wire that mowed over the spectators. The jet crashed into the stands and exploded in flames, sending metal debris into the crowd. Both pilots actually ejected after they hit the ground, and they both managed to somehow survive, and they were immediately blamed for the crash. 
Pilot Topinar was sentenced to 14 years in prison. Pilot Yegorov was sentenced to eight years in prison. And the details of the official investigation were never released to the public, but 77 spectators died in the crash and another 543 were injured. The next deadliest air show disaster on our list took place in 1951 at the Fall Day Festival in Flagler, Colorado. And this involved a pilot that never should have been flying the plane, let alone performing in the show. Now at the time, air shows were still a relatively new concept, and the Civil Aeronautics Administration, which is now known as the FAA, questioned the public value of such air shows unless the utmost safety measures were enforced. In order for the air show to get approval, multiple provisions were put in place, but most notably were three new requirements. First, that no aircraft be flown toward, over, or within 500 feet of the spectators. Second, Prior to the beginning of the air show, all pilots had to attend a briefing explaining the rules and order of events. And third, all acrobatic maneuvers shall be completed 500 feet or more above the ground. Air Force Lieutenant Norman Jones was scheduled to fly his Tudor aircraft for the show. Lieutenant Jones had about 2,500 hours of flight time, but it was all in bomber aircraft, and there was no record of him having any experience flying small planes acrobatically. In fact, the airshow promoter had only met Lieutenant Jones a few days before the show, and he simply trusted the lieutenant when the lieutenant said he could do it. However, the evidence indicated that Lieutenant Jones's only experience with the aircraft was a 30-minute flight the day prior to the show, and he intended to practice the maneuvers on the 110-mile flight from Denver down to Flagler on the day of the show, but there's no evidence that he actually did. Lieutenant Jones took off late from Denver that morning, and as a result, he was expected to begin his performance immediately upon arrival, meaning there was no opportunity for him to attend a safety briefing before the show to hear the rules. Lieutenant Jones began his performance, and he flew over the runway at an altitude of 150 feet, and he was only 100 feet away from the crowd. Now, he began a roll to the right, and upon reaching the inverted portion of the roll, the nose dropped too low, and the aircraft turned about 30 degrees in the direction of the spectators. As he tried to complete the roll, the left wing struck the ground, and the aircraft disintegrated, killing Lieutenant Jones and 19 spectators, including 13 children. At the time, this was the deadliest airshow disaster in history, and all of these tragedies serve as a reminder of the dangers of flying, and each disaster led to new rules and restrictions that were designed to keep both airshow performers and the spectators safe. Now, if you learned something from this pilot debrief, then be sure to check out this other one on the channel here, and I'll see you next time.